I've got a message tonight that, um, I don't know, we'll, we'll see how this goes. I warned my staff earlier today, I said, this, this message has the potential for all kinds of stuff coming out that isn't in my notes. And um, if, if uh, for, my, for my pastor friends here, you know that that's a dangerous thing. Pastor Dale, you know that's dangerous, right? You feel it when you're preparing. It's like, yeah, these are my notes, but I could real easy just go sideways and say what I really think about some things. But um, anyway, the title of my message tonight is Something Wicked This Way Comes. Something Wicked This Way Comes. I borrowed it from my dear friend Shakespeare. It's a line from Shakespeare's Macbeth, the famous play. Um, I don't normally start with quotes or stories from Shakespeare, but this, is, this has captivated me um, because I see what's happening in the world today, uh, what's happening in our neighborhoods today, what's happening in our churches today is exactly what Shakespeare wrote about 500 years ago. So let me give you a little primer on Macbeth. Macbeth's a good guy. He's a faithful general servant to King Duncan. And he's coming back from a great victory. And on his way back from victory, he runs into three different witches, three different demon-possessed witches. And one of the witches says to Macbeth, here's the deal. Well, she didn't say it like that, but she said, you know, in Shakespearean English, here's the deal. She said, um, you're going to become king. And so a witch prophesies over him that he's going to become king, except there's a problem because there already is a king, King Duncan, and he has an heir. He's got a son. And so in order for Macbeth to become king, the king has to be killed and his son has to be killed. But here's what happens. When the witch prophesies to him that he's going to be king, it taps into some unknown, deep longing and lusting in his own heart, some kind of selfish ambition to be something that he never spent much time thinking about before. But it was an unredeemed part of his life that was pricked and touched by a seducing spirit from a demon-possessed witch. Macbeth goes at the prodding and the encouragement of his Jezebel-like wife. He ends up killing King Duncan. He ends up contributing to the death of Duncan's son, and he's made king. Macbeth becomes king. He turns into something he never imagined, a murderer who then in his craziness and in his insanity becomes a deranged, tormented, and wicked soul. Macbeth departed from being a faithful servant of the king because he gave heed to a seducing spirit that spoke to his selfish ambition and his lust for power and position. Now you go, well, Pastor Steve, what does that have to do with us tonight? It has everything to do with us tonight, friends, because that exact same seductive, deceiving spirit is on the increase in our world today. It's on the increase in our world, in our politics, in our culture, and yes, in our churches. And you need to understand what seductive, seducing spirits are and what they accomplish. You need to understand how to war against them because they are on the increase, as the Scripture said. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 would begin our study tonight. Paul writes to young Timothy and says, Now the Spirit expressly or explicitly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. The Holy Spirit expressly or specifically or explicitly very strong language. 
Paul writes and says the Holy Spirit is explicitly saying, he's given a strong warning to pay attention and to wake up to something that's going to be happening in the last days. It's going to be in the last days for a reason. Because in the last days, there's going to be an increase in demonic influence. And Revelation chapter 12, verse 2 tells us it is going to happen because the devil knows that his days are short. And so the enemy of our soul is increasing his demonic activity among the people of God and among humanity as a whole. He's increasing every seductive, devilish thing that he's up to. And what's it going to cause? Listen to me, friends. It's going to cause a departure from the faith. Everybody say, the faith. It's going to cause a departure from the faith, meaning faith in the teachings and tenets of Christianity, i.e. the word and the will and the ways of God. These seductive spirits, these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils are going to cause people, whether they're followers of Jesus or not, they at least know what's right and wrong. And these seducing spirits are going to cause them to cast away everything that they know to be true and right. Just like Macbeth, casting away everything he knew to be true and right because he lusted and longed for something that he didn't even know was in there until he was seduced. Friends, this departure... It's way more seductive. I want you to listen to me. We're not here to play games tonight. I'm here to speak the truth to you. This departure is way more seductive and deceptive than being just this in your face, I no longer believe in God. That's, that's too normal, right? That's, that's too obvious, And when you're dealing with seductive spirits, they don't deal in the obvious, they deal in the hidden. It's a departure from God's ways, listen to me, while saying you believe in God. These are those that Paul warned Timothy about in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. It is those who have a form of godliness, but they actually deny or resist the power of the gospel. And what does Paul say about these people who have a form of godliness, who play religious games, who get dressed up for church, who know how to shout and clap and dance, but live a godless life outside of church? What did Paul say about them? And from such people, turn away. Well, I guess Paul was just in a really bad mood when he wrote that. Paul didn't write it. The Holy Spirit wrote it. And this is such an egregious sin that the Holy Spirit says through Paul, when you've got people who look the part and play the part, but don't live the part, get away from them. Get away from them, and from such people turn away. It's people that Paul talked about in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, where he said what? They profess to know God, but in works they deny him or they resist him. He said they're abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Somebody say, whoa. Whoa! People who are seduced by devilish spirits and are deceived say the game and play the game but don't live the game. Paul says not only get away from them, but they're an abomination, they're disobedient, and they are disqualified. They have disqualified themselves from being used in the kingdom of God because of their Macbeth behavior, because of their unredeemed lusting and longing for something else and more that isn't theirs. Why did they depart from the faith? Because they give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 
and say they departed from the faith because they had a bad day or that something went wrong. It said, no, they took heed. They listened to, they valued, they obeyed impressions and whisperings and ways of the seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. How many of you know wicked spirits are talking? We, we can't just, Joan, we can't just hear that and say like, oh yes. No, like wicked spirits are talking to people today. They are seductive. They are seducing. They are whispering and beguiling. They are lying and they are slandering in order to destroy the work of God. And if we don't start paying attention and discerning seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, all we're doing is signing up, waiting our turn to be seduced and deceived ourselves. Across the country and around the world, I know you guys don't, this isn't your, your sphere of influence. It's not the atmosphere that many of you live in, but I can tell you as a pastor that I have heard more in the last year and a half of more godless things happening in churches and more godless things happening around the world from in the church than I had ever heard of in my 30 years prior of pastoring. Something wicked this way comes. Something has happened. Something has been unleashed. We are living in a different day and a different time. And if we don't discern it, if we just act like the church in 1930 Germany, we are going to be overcome by a modern day Hitler attack. I promise you. Larry, you know this to be true. If you're one step ahead of your people, you're a leader. If you're two steps ahead of your people, you're a prophet. If you're three steps in front of your people, you're a martyr. I don't want to be a martyr, but I won't mind being a leader and a prophet. I won't mind saying what is going to happen to the church in America and America as a whole if we don't stop listening to and heeding seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. If we put our head in the sand, if we pretend that everything is just fine, it always amazed me, Pastor, how does this work? When, when Jesus is talking about the end times, how does it work where some people are going to be saying peace and safety while Jesus said in Matthew 24, all hell's going to be breaking loose? The only way you can say peace and safety in a world that we have today is if your head is in the sand and you're not paying attention to what's really going on. Yesterday's conspiracy is today's reality. You've heard me say that. We live in dangerous times, and the church better discern it and not be deceived by it. I love this definition of seduction as much as it just whew, terrifies me. What is seduction? It's to persuade to disloyalty through flattering promises. That's what seduction is. To persuade someone to disloyalty through flattering promises. Macbeth, you can become king. Well, I know there's a king and an heir, but you can murder them and become king. And after he does the deed, and becomes this wicked thing. The same people that seduced him into being a crazed murderer then said to him when they saw him approaching, something wicked this way comes. He had become, Marianne, the very thing that they prophesied over him. Whew. 
because he allowed himself to be seduced. Disloyal to the king through a flattering promise. The purpose of seduction. The purpose of, you've got to get this. If you get this in the whole mess, get this. The purpose of seduction is to promote or preserve yourself at any cost. This is the purpose of seduction, spiritual seduction. It is to promote yourself or preserve yourself at any cost. In other words, seduction and deception plays on your selfish longings for promotion or your greatest fears of reduction and offers you a devilish deal in return. And tell you something, if you're being seduced right now, ultimately, when you fall for seduction, it's going to cost you more than you ever imagined. Here's what seduction does. Seduction promises you the immediate, and it never tells you about the eternal. That's how it works. Seduction so plays into our unredeemed places, our hidden places, that we end up falling for the shiny thing that's dangled. Not even being sober enough, Scott, to look beyond it to see what it's ultimately going to cost me. Something wicked this way comes. Where did seduction originate? Anybody want to take a guess? Huh? No, the garden. Way before the garden. Thank you, Sarah McCalvey. Can stand up, Sarah, real quick. Can we all give Sarah a yes? That's right, Sarah, you got it. Seduction didn't start in the garden. It started in the garden for humanity after it had already worked in heaven. I want to read you a passage of scripture where your Bible pages are still stuck together because nobody reads Ezekiel chapter 28. You're going to open it up and moths and dust are going to fly out. Seduction started with Lucifer long before the Garden of Eden. God exposes him. In Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 18, it's all I'm going to read. There's more. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. You were in Eden. He's not talking about the king of Tyre specifically. He's talking about the king of Tyre who was operating under the same seducing spirit. So he calls him the king of Tyre, but ultimately what God does is he calls out Lucifer. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, and diamond, barrel, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. God said, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You, listen to this. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Everybody say, uh-oh. Now go ahead, say it again, uh-oh. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Iniquity is planned to sin. Here we go. By the abundance of your trading. In the Hebrew, it would more accurately say, by the peddling of of yourself by the peddling of yourself 
You became filled with violence within. It means unjust gain. Satan, as you peddled yourself, you were filled with a desire for unjust gain. Even though you had everything, you wanted more. You lusted for more. You weren't satisfied with what God had done for you. This man driving me crazy. I thought it was this. Let's try that. Thank you, Pastor. You always got to be careful when the world strip walks us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You became filled with violence, with unjust gain, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart, listen, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. You allowed your wisdom to become corrupted because you so longed to have more splendor. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities and again, by the iniquity of the peddling of yourself. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. I devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Beloved, I can't say this seriously enough. Seducing spirits have their origin in Satan himself. Think about that for a minute. Seducing spirits, their origin is from Satan himself doing what he did before the world was even created where God cast him out as a profane thing. Lucifer's selfish ambition and his lust for more power and position caused him to seek something that didn't belong to him. He then seduced persuaded and promised things to the other angels by trading, peddling, and promoting himself. He sinned, he was judged, and destroyed by being cast out of heaven, along with who else? A third of the other angels who allowed themselves to be seduced. Listen to Pastor Steve. If an angel in heaven beholding the very glory of God can be seduced, don't think he can't. I told you I had a word from the United Senator. I said I had a word. I told you at dinner the other night. The minute you say, oh, that'll never happen to me, Katie, bar the door, because here it comes. I read my Bible. I learned what Peter's, from Peter's example. I'll never deny you. I never knew him. That fast. There are people who are being seduced and deceived today in the world and in the church, and they have no idea. Satan so irate and tormented about his own fall that he's targeted humanity to seduce them, to get them to depart from the faith and fall as he did. He knows just how to do it with people who have secret longings for promotion rooted in selfish ambition and secret fears of reduction rooted in insecurity. He knows just how to play it. We need to beware of the seduction that causes the falling away from Christian truth and virtue. Beware of the deal. The deal. The shiny thing that says, satisfy and gratify yourself right 
now because that's all that matters. Rhonda, that's it right there. Come on, look at it, fixate upon it. It can all be yours. Just be disloyal and this flattering promise is all yours. Come and get it. I'm not talking about mere temptation. I'm talking about a seducing spirit. Well, if I'm not out there farther enough, how about we jump right in all together? I need to preface this by saying that I am eternally grateful for Governor Bill Lee a spirit-filled man of God who is the governor of our state and leads and desires to do that which is righteous. I am grateful for our senators and our representatives in the state of Tennessee who long to see God's kingdom come and God's will be done right here in Tennessee, even as it is in heaven. I am grateful for every one of my congressman friends or senator friends in Washington, D.C., who are there to do the Lord's work, who aren't there only to get wealthy, but are there because they're called by God and are sacrificing themselves and their families to fight where nobody else is fighting. I am eternally grateful for those people, and we know a bunch of them. But I have to talk to you tonight about seduction in politics. Selfish ambition, self-promotion, self-preservation. There are politicians who align themselves with seducing spirits to sell out the American people to either promote or preserve themselves or their party. It's a fact, Jack, and if you don't think it's a fact, you ain't paying attention. Start paying attention. Open borders, free passage, handshakes in front of luxury hotels for illegal aliens to stroll in and to mock our immigration system. Government hands out. What do you think that's for, y'all? Come on. That's not because they're being nice. It's because they're looking for one thing. I'm going to say it three times. Votes, votes, and votes. And it is a seducing spirit that causes godless politicians to sacrifice the nation just for votes in order to preserve and to promote themselves and their party. Listen to me. Somebody's got to get mad about this. It might as well be the preacher. We've got more fentanyl and heroin crossing our border and the current administration is doing nothing about it. Nothing. 18 to 45 year olds, you know what the greatest killer is in the United States of America? 18 to 45 year olds are dying as a result of fentanyl that is made in China coming across our border in Mexico and we're doing nothing about it. I'm telling you, if my child w went to heaven as a result of an accidental overdose, I would be fit to be tied. I would camp in front of the White House and say, sir, my son's blood is on your hands because you're doing nothing about it. This isn't political. This is spiritual. This is biblical. It is seduction. It is seduction that allows these things to happen. Humans are being trafficked across our border. And in the name of compassion, we are putting little boys and girls into sexual slavery. Are you kidding me? Can somebody see this isn't compassion? This is corruption. Student loan forgiveness. Oh, I'm in it so deep already. Who cares? A half a trillion dollars. Five hundred billion dollars. And you say votes, votes, and votes? <laughs> Listen. Oh, man. 
Let me say it this way. This is nicer. If the cost of your college education isn't worth you paying for it, it's surely not worth me paying for it. Seduction in politics. Doing, saying, providing, do whatever it is, just so I can remain in power. I don't care about what's best for this country. I care about what's best for me. And if I can sell the American people out to get the approval of my congressional district, well, that's all I care about. If I can keep my position within the party by selling the American people out, I listen to the seduction. I listen to the enemy. Just play along with the team. Be a good team player. Go ahead. You'll win next time. Forget what the issue of right and wrong is. This isn't about right and wrong. This is about you, your future, your security. Enough of that. How about seduction in culture? Calling evil good and good evil, furthering an evil philosophy and doing it for the sake of money. Seducing spirits, seduce adults and children alike. Indoctrinating children in our public schools. Sexual perversion in our classrooms and in our libraries. Pride parades, gender fluidity. Right here in Franklin, Tennessee, friends. When I personally went to Mayor Moore and sat in his office and asked him about it and said to him, Here, here's a pride Picnic, that's one thing. But when you've got a little child, five, six-year-old, handing money to a transgender stripper dancer right in front of them, happening in Franklin, Tennessee, he told me, my staff told me that that never happened. We've got pictures and video of it. Don't tell me it didn't happen. What kind of seduction? What kind of deception? Wow, we... I don't want to rock the boat. Somebody's got to rock it. Somebody's got to say something. Bodily mutilation. That's what's happening to our children today. Listen, this will blow your mind. There, there's two drugs that are used for transitioning children. One of them is uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate, and the other is Lupron. It has been suggested before that these two drugs be given to chemically castrate convicted rapists. All right, let's, let's take their fire out. The ACLU fights these drugs being given to convicted rapists. Can I tell you what the ACLU approves? Giving those same drugs to children. It's happening right now. Right now. But it really shouldn't surprise us, should it? Because the same people that want to mutilate a baby in its mother's wombs are the same people that want to mutilate a baby in government classrooms. Why should we be surprised? We were with Matt Waltz the other night at the premiering of his, of his movie, What is a Woman? After it was over, every single person in this room and watching me should watch that movie, What is a Woman by Matt Waltz. When it was over, there was a time for Q&A, and one of the people in the back stood up and said, uh, I got a question. What should the church be doing or saying about this right now? Let me show you what Matt did. He, he went like this. He went, anything. Anything. Because what's he saying? They're doing nothing. 
The pulpits in America are silent, and this is the defining issue of our day and of our time. Again, our head is in the sand. We're 1930s Germany. We're turning our music up so we don't hear the screams of the Jews going by in packed cattle cars or our children being rushed out of school into hospitals that are funded by transgender billionaires at pharmaceutical companies who make a fortune by our kids being sacrificed on the altar of gender fluidity. We're silent. We're watching it all happen. How about seduction in the church? Politics and culture. How about the church? Let me tell you what seduction in the church is about. Two things. That the church will approve wickedness or be silent about the wickedness. Those are the two areas of seduction that pastors are having to deal with right now. And we've got not just pastors, we've got entire denominations who are affirming and approving things that God's word says are an abomination. And while that's happening, we've got pastors over here on the other extreme that are saying, oh, we can't say anything about this. I'm going to get canceled. I've been canceled. We're here on Monday night with hundreds of people looking to hear the truth. I better not say anything. People people will run out of church. People will quit giving. Our numbers are going to be down. We can't do that. So let's either approve that which is wicked or be silent about that which is wicked. How about we speak the truth in love? How about in our passion to prevent children from being mutilated, we can we convey with a deep compassion the people that are lost and doing these things that are heinous. See, it seems like people that want to stand for the truth can only just just come out and just have hatred in them. I don't have hatred. I want to tell people the truth. I want you to get saved and born again because we can't legislate that level of morality. You want to abuse children? Like, you need help, man. You need help. Jesus is your help and your hope. And there's churches out there that preach a strong Jesus who can deliver you miraculously from things that you have participated in for who knows how long. There is a Jesus that loves you, that has grace. There are churches that love you, that have grace, that will not condone your sin like we will any other sin, but we will lead you to a powerful Savior who can deliver you from your sin and give you hope and healing. Last month, July 2022, the Episcopal Church approved ordaining gay, bi, trans priests, bishops, etc. In their 80th General Convention, they voted just last month Resolution DO66. It calls for the Episcopal Church to, quote, advocate for access to gender-affirming care in all of its forms, social, medical, and other, and at all ages. This is the Episcopal Church. It goes on to say that advocating for sex change operations is, quote, part of our baptismal call to respect the dignity of every human being. Part of our baptism, it is blasphemy. The resolution specifically, quote, affirms that all Episcopalians should be able to partake in gender-affirming care with no restriction on movement, autonomy, or timing. 
The Episcopal Church also opposes laws that prohibit people, including children, from being medically assisted in their attempts to change their sex. What the Episcopal Church refers to as gender-affirming care includes medical interventions such as the use of puberty blockers and hormone replacement therapy, as well as surgeries, listen, that permanently damage fully functioning body parts. There is no going back for a child who participates in, in gender transformation. There are even honest transgender people right now whose bodies are literally deformed. Dozens of surgeries, their bodies twisted and deformed because of the drugs they were given and the surgeries they went under. Current transgender people saying, don't do this to children. Don't do it to children. It's abuse. It's mutilation. We're too afraid to say a doggone thing about it. Better for a millstone to be tied around their neck than to hurt one of these little ones, Jesus said. Methodist churches. Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the Mennonite Church. I couldn't believe it when I read it just this week. The Mennonites folded caved to seducing spirits, approving and promoting abominable behavior. And the, what did some of these people do? They say we do it because we love them. We just want to love everybody and welcome But I want to love everybody and welcome everybody. I'm just not going to love them and tell them what they're doing is okay. I'm glad somebody told me, Steve, being a fornicator and a drug addict and a loser and everything else that you were, it isn't okay. You need to repent of your sins, get right with God, and start a new life in Christ with power and victory. Thank God somebody challenged me about my sin. Thank God someone challenged me about my future that caused me to position myself to say, Jesus, I got nothing. I'm not worth nothing. I don't got nothing. There's nothing going for me. But if you can do something with this wreck of a life, it's all yours. The son of God got up from his throne in heaven and said, I hear you, pal. Watch and see. Come on, somebody. This is what he does. I'm tired of preaching a powerless Jesus. Jesus that saves, Jesus that heals, Jesus that delivers. This is the Jesus I know from the scripture. I don't know what milk toast Jesus you think about, but the Jesus I know is the Son of God, raised with power, proving who he is. Loving people. Loving people is doing what Paul did in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Listen to the heartbeat of the apostle as he speaks to the decadent Corinthians. He said, do you not know? The unrighteous aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. Well, there's Paul being all negative again. No, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then what does he say? Don't be deceived. Don't be seduced because you can, because it's possible don't be deceived in thinking that unrighteous people, unrepentant people, unbloodwashed people go to heaven while they maintain their sinful lifestyle. Don't be deceived about that. It doesn't happen. Neither fornicators. That's heterosexual people that have sex out of marriage. Nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then Paul says these powerful words. And such were some of you. You used to be that list. You might have been one. You might have been five. You might have been every one of them. You could have been so messed up. And such were. Anybody remember worse past tense, isn't it? Were means you were, not you are. You and such were some of you, but something happened. What happened? But you were washed. 
you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Beloved, we've got to preach a gospel that informs people of what their sin is, but then lets them know what their hope is. You can be washed. You can be sanctified. You can be justified through the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't got to stay the way you are. You can start brand new. That's the message. We can't shy away from that. Loving people is telling them the truth. It's the best news in the world. We're not loving people when we withhold truth and allow them to slip through our fingers into eternal judgment. That's not loving. What are lost people going to say to the priests and the bishops come judgment day? When they get judged... And they look at the priest and the bishop and they say, you, you, you had a collar on. You wore robes. You stood behind the pulpit. And you told me I was okay. You told me you loved me. But you didn't tell me to repent and get right with God. You told me it was all all right, that he was all right with me, and that love was acceptance and affirmation rather than truth and repentance. Why didn't you tell me the truth? I want no man's blood on my hands. Friends, it's not just out there somewhere else. I had the elder, an elder in a local church last year texted me. This is an elder in a local church texted me and said, I deceived myself and I deceived you. I am going to step down from being an elder. A year later, he is still an elder in that exact same church. I wonder what seducing spirit came and whispered to him. I wonder what seducing spirit came and said, Hey, you don't need to step down. What are you going to tell people the truth? that you deceived yourself and that you deceived other people? Think of your reputation. Shiny, 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 shiny. Think of your position. Think about preserving yourself and your office. What did other men who were functioning under a seducing spirit tell him? Oh, no, no, no. Now, don't be hasty. You, you don't need to step down. I mean, you, you, you admitted it, and that's kind of enough. Friends, I know my Bible pretty good. And nowhere in my Bible, somebody challenged me, pastors, if I'm wrong. Larry, you've been in the ministry for 50 years. Challenge me if I'm wrong right now publicly. Rebuke me, I'll take it. If you can show me one place in the Bible where being a deceiver and deceiving others, being self-deceived and deceiving others is a qualification for being an elder. Is it there? Everything opposite of that is there. You see, it's not, I don't want you to just think that it's, it's out there, it's out there somewhere else. It's down the street. wonder what the deal was. The deal that was made and accepted. What was the deal? How long have I been going? Don't egg me on. I'm sweating and everything up here. Let me talk to you quickly. Preacher talk, that's 30 minutes in a message like this. 
Matthew 24, the famous end times passage of Scripture. I told my dear friend Amir Tsarfati, who was coming here to talk to us about the end times, I said, Amir, I want you to do something. Because I never see anybody, I've never heard one message on this. In nearly 40 years of following Jesus, 30 plus years of being a pastor. Matthew 24, everybody wants to talk about the signs of the end times. Last days, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, right? All of these kind of earth-shattering, earth-shaking things. Nobody talks about relational issues in the end times. It's right there in the same passage. He said, there's going to be hatred. There's going to be betrayal. There's going to be um, persecution. There's going to be killing. All of these things are going to happen within society in the end times, and yet nobody is talking about what's happening in society right now with hatred, persecution, betrayal, and killing. Killing people physically, killing people's reputation, killing people. It's end time stuff, man. It's seducing spirits in the end days. It's happening now in our day and in our time. Wake up, please. Follower of Jesus, please wake up. What was the defining message that Jesus gave? What are the end times going to be about? Not about famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Not about wars and rumors of wars. The number one thing Jesus said in Matthew 24, and he said it five different times, it's about deception. He said it in verse 4, he said it in verse 5, he said it in verse 11, and he said it again in verse 24. Deception is going to be the defining characteristic and warning of the end times. It's the same thing that Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11. Listen to this. The coming of the lawless one, he's speaking of the Antichrist. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Lying wonders is seduction and deception. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Because they didn't receive the love of the truth that they actually might be saved. Every bit of seduction and deception happening now is preparing people for the ultimate deception of the Antichrist himself. And if we don't understand seduction and deception right now, we are surely not going to understand it when the Antichrist shows up. Seduced and deceived people, Jesus said, will be responsible for hating, betraying, persecuting, and killing those who stand for truth. He said in John 16, verses 1 through 4, that they're even going to say, we're doing God a service. You see what I'm saying? They still profess a knowledge of God. They, they still associate with God. We're doing God a favor by killing the guy who stands for truth, by killing the woman who stands for truth. That's deception as a result of seduction. Something wicked this way comes. How can we endure to the end? I'm going to run through these fast. Y'all have been really good. How can we endure to the end under such satanic influence and attack all around us? Because Jesus said, if you endure to the end, you'll be saved. He didn't say, if you quit halfway through, you'll be saved. He said, if you'll endure to the end, you'll be saved. How can we endure to the end? Number one, do one of the bravest things you can do and examine yourself. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. How can I not fall prey to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil? Do a checkup from the neck up. Examine yourself. Whether you're in the faith, not whether you're confessing a belief in God, but whether the, the Christian virtues are real in your life. Or have you been seduced by a flattering promise? Number two, y'all, we got to seek God's face. Psalm 27, verse 8. David writes and says, when you said, he's speaking to God, God, when you said, seek my face, my heart said back to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. I think as a pastor over the years, I hope I haven't failed. I tell people, get in the word, get the word inside of you. I, I, that just doesn't mean reading your Bible. Like we've got to seek the face of God. 
We've got to read our word. We've got to ask him what the truth is. We've got to seek his face. Number three, we've got to know God's truth. John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you're going to know the truth, and the truth's going to make you free. Listen, we always preach that. I mean, you know, it's going to make you free from addiction or make you free from hell or make you free. How about if it just knowing the truth makes you free from being seduced? Know God's truth. Seek God's face. Examine yourself. Number four, do God's truth. Isn't that crazy? Not just know it, but do it. James 1.22, you got to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deceiving yourselves. Because there's something that comes into us that says, it's enough for me to know and understand what Pastor Ian or Pastor Dale or Pastor Mark or Pastor Larry or Pastor Steve, it's enough for me to know it. It's not enough to know it. It's only enough when we do it. Lest we deceive ourselves. Next, you've got to be filled with God's Spirit. Ephesians 5.18. Don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation and riotous behavior, but be continually filled is what it means in the Greek. Be continually filled with the Spirit. Doesn't that just seem right? That, that if I'm filled with the Spirit of God, I'm not going to be seduced by a seducing spirit? See, when I'm functioning in the Spirit of God, when the seducing spirit comes, it's immediately recognized as a counterfeit. But if I'm void of the Spirit of God, any seducing spirit that comes my way and pretends to be something holy, man, I can fall for it like that. Next, you've got to stand for God's truth regardless of the cost. It's one of my life verses, Acts 20, 22 through 24. Paul says, and see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. Look at what he says. Not knowing the things that are going to happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies that in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. I don't know what's going to happen when I get there, but the Holy Spirit seems to be saying to me, every city I go to, Paul, you're going to have trouble. Chains and tribulations, that's what you're going to have in this city. That's what you're going to have in this city. That's when you're going to... Some of us would go, well, that couldn't be the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit just wants me to be happy and joyful and never have a problem. And, you know, it's just supposed to be getting raptured out from behind my convertible Mercedes in my $3 million house in Williamson County. Isn't that God's will for my life? No! God's will is for us to pick up our cross and deny ourselves and follow Him regardless of the cost. Paul said, I don't know, but chains and tribulations await me. Then listen to these words. But none of these things move me. What a champ. Oh, what a brave heart moment. But none of these things move me. I don't care what the devil has for me in every single city on earth. I care what God has for me in the city whose builder and maker is God. And that's where my sights are focused on. And so this world can have its way with me. I'm ready and preparing myself for the next. None of these things move me. I don't count my life dear to myself. I'm going to finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Stand for God's truth regardless of the cost. Finally, obviously, don't entertain seductive, self-promoting, self-preserving spirits that cause you to sell yourself that cause you to sell others out so you can be something more, so you can preserve that which you already have, don't do it. Now the Spirit explicitly says that in the last days, 
Some are going to depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Something wicked this way comes. Prepare yourselves. Remain faithful to Jesus because that's what matters in the end. Are you sure you're glad you came tonight? Are you sure you are? This isn't to get you. This isn't to get you paranoid. It's to get you to be prepared. Mark, come on, come here. Dale and Ian, come here. Mark, come here. Larry, come here for a minute. We got any other pastors in the room? Any 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 other pastors? Is that it? Come on, right over here. Now listen, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're ending this today. We're going to pray for these men. And then we're going to ask these men. Come on, Larry, get in here tight and close. We all know and love each other. We're going to pray for these men who pastor local churches, who have served the local church, in Larry's case, for 50 years, been a culture warrior since almost before I was born, faithfully serving God. Let's pray for these men. Would you stretch your hand out this way real quick? Come on. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for these shepherds who have given and are giving their life for the sheep. Lord, you've entrusted to these men hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that look to them, God, for truth, for light, and for life. Father, we pray that you would anoint them with power from heaven, courage with power from heaven, to stand in the pulpit and to speak the truth in love. God, thank you that they do and are and will, but we continue to pray over them for their futures. God, may they stand in the blast furnace of opposition and do the right thing regardless of how it feels. Lord, may they blow the trumpet in Zion. Father, bless these men. Anoint these men. Use these men. Father, in the name of Jesus. Do what we pray now for their congregations, for the people they serve, for the articles they write and everything they do. God bless and anoint and give these men an unusual amount of courage more than they've ever had before. Pastor Mark now just wants you to pray. I want you to pray for the precious people out here. Mon Michael, pick you up. Go ahead. What am I praying for? You're praying for these praying people for right here. Okay. Well, Lord, we thank you right now for your spirit that is in this place. And we're declaring right now a boldness and a courageousness over the church here today. Yes, sir, God. Lord, that we will walk in truth and discernment, a Holy Spirit level of discernment yes, right sir. now. If you need discernment, I, I pray you lift your hand right now Jesus. and just ask the Holy Spirit yeah. because this is what we need to fight the battle right That's now. Right. Right. We need Come to on, identify the sin yeah. and love the sinner and yeah. bring them to repentance. God, give us the boldness <laughs> to love people yes, sir, and God. give us the boldness to preach the truth. We're yes, declaring sir. right now that this region will be on fire yes, for God. righteousness and holiness, yeah. revival, healing, miracles, signs yeah. and wonders, that even the lost will say, what must I do to be saved? That's right. That they will be drawn to your presence yeah. yes. because we stand for righteousness yes. and holiness. And God, yes. would you unite the church together yes. like never yes, before, yes, yes, that yes. the enemy cannot divide us. He will not separate us, that we will see the glory and the blessing Yes. of John 17 oneness yes. in this city Jesus. and may the church rise up in Jesus' yes. name. Yes. Amen, amen, and amen, amen, amen. Man, y'all have been awesome listeners tonight. I pray that the Spirit of God gives you an ear to hear everything that was said and prayed and that you would appropriate it in your life where necessary. May the church arise. As Mark prayed, may the church arise and be everything that we've been called to be in Jesus' name. God bless you all. We love you. We bless you in the name of Jesus. We'll see you next month. We'll see you somewhere before that even, I hope. But God bless you mightily. Go in the spirit and power of Jesus and make him famous everywhere you go. In Jesus' name, amen.